everyone. Welcome to our first Transitional Live session to 2024, Live to the Call of Justice. Um, my name's Rona. Um, I'm based in Bristol. I'm from the Scottish Borders. Um, I recently started at Transition Together about three or four months ago as the Just Transition Lead, so looking at how we can implement further um, Just Transition principles and practices into Transition Together and into the wider transition movement, which is exactly what we're going to be exploring further tonight. Um, I'm joined by Rob as my, my co-host, um, and we've also got five amazing contributors here with us tonight, who I'm sure you're excited to hear from. Um, we're joined by Rakesh, Rose, Steve, Yaz, and Pauline, um, who are all going to be taking us through different ways that transition, just transition can be brought alive in, in communities and in transition groups. Um, while you've been trickling in, hopefully you've been filling out this link that's been in the chat to a Mentimeter asking a question, what does the phrase just transition mean to you? You can also scan that QR code or put the link in the chat again. Um, but it's a way to gather some perspectives and see what, so, see what we have in the room. I know the phrase just transition can mean really different things to different people. So hopefully if the tech works okay, it should bring up a link to a Mentimeter. Perfect, nice. Surprise that worked. Um, so these are all of the different responses that have been put into that link um, while we've been joining. Um, massive range there. As I said, I think just transition can mean so many different things to different people. Um, so we have climate justice and social justice and justice coming a lot, up a lot, as well as fairness, um, solidarity, regeneration, democratic, equal community, um, systemic, also accessible, mutual age, kindness for all, access, equal, collaborative, transformation, I like that one, um, movement, tricky and, and balance, change, aspiration, wow, loads in there, yeah, so much, so much there, amazing, thank you all for, for participating in that and for filling that out. Um, I'm going to hand over to Rob now, who's going to chat for, for five or so minutes about some background of just transition in the transition movement, um, so that we can kind of get a bit of grounding there. Um, and then we'll we'll talk through the rest of the session and, and what we're here to explore tonight. Um, thank you. I'll hand over to Rob. Uh, naively, perhaps that quote, the transition approach seems seeks to facilitate a degree of dialogue and inclusion that has rarely been achieved before, uh, but had a little practical idea about how to actually achieve that. So I think we assumed that the urgency of the situation overrode such details and that somehow doing transition would itself act as the glue that brought communities together that we'd figure it out as we went along. And when Sophie Banks and Hilary Prentice created what we call now call inner transition, they brought a focus on transition only being as successful as its ability to feel accessible to as many people as possible. And that good facilitation and creating cultures of deep learning and inclusivity were all teachable skills and the transition training that Sophie and Naresh Jangrande uh, developed, which some of you I'm sure did, uh, embodied that. From its inception, though, it was an issue that Transition Network really recognised as being vital. Between 2010 and 2011, Katrina Pickering, some of you may remember, worked as Transition Network's diversity coordinator. Her role was to look at how transition initiatives were doing in terms of diversity and inclusion and to develop tools and resources to support them in becoming better at it. She ran workshops and trainings around the country and helped to bring the issue to the fore. And her insights and suggested tools were gathered together in a publication in 2011 called Seven Ingredients for a Just, Fair and Inclusive Transition. Uh, in her 2010 thesis, Danielle Cohen looked into the issue of diversity in one of the inner city London neighbourhoods where there was a transition group and wrote that transition was not, quote, explicitly concerned with social justice. And by the time of the Transition Companion that came out in 2013, there was a much greater emphasis on it with it being woven into some of the ingredients that we now saw being used by transition groups as this movement was rapidly spreading at the time. And while some groups gave the large majority of their focus to other aspects of doing transition, some groups made inclusivity and diversity a key focus of their work with Transition Town Tooting's Earth Talk Walk and their Trash Catchers Carnival coming to mind uh, and 
other groups may just transition their focus, like Cooperation Humboldt in the US. And in 2014, Samuel Alexander in Australia wrote a paper that explored diversity and inclusion in the transition movement. And he wrote, the authenticity of the movement's desire for inclusivity is not in doubt. We only seek to inquire into the realization of that desire. Uh, and he wrote that since Cohen's critique quote, transition now explicitly engages with issues of social justice, albeit only in passing still. Uh, and it could be argued that we're still in that period, although we're intentionally and consciously working our way out of it, as is hopefully evidenced by the greater emphasis on, on social justice in our seed funding support, many of which of you have participated in, and in our training programmes, in Rona's appointment and in events like this evening. Social justice and inclusion have, at Transition Together, driven the makeup of our core group membership, guided all the activities and resources that we've put out, our trainings and our facilitation. There was a guy called Luigi Russi who wrote uh, an amazing book about the transition movement in 2015 called uh, Everything Gardens. And he wrote in that the unfolding dynamic quality of transition as a moving and not a completed movement. And it's this moving, I think, the way that transition adapts and evolves and weaves in new threads that has been one of its great strengths over its lifetime. And part of, um, part of Daniel Cohen's uh, uh, critique focused on the idea uh, that trans which transition absorbed from open space technology of whoever comes are the right people but she said no 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 whoever comes are more likely actually to be very similar to the person who put out the invitation unless a con unless a conscious effort is made to actually widen that invitation and so in 2016, Mena Grossman and Emily Creamer, who did some research, were able to write in a critique of the transition movement that while there were still many issues unresolved, <coughs> diversity and, um, 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 hang on, I've lost my bits, I've just lost my thread there. Um, while a lot of were able to say that while there were many issues unresolved, diversity and inclusion is fundamental to transition philosophy, but said that the passively inclusive approach to steering group recruitment is insufficient for delivering internal group diversity. And over the years, a number of researchers have tran challenged the transition movement on diversity questions. Um, in 2020, Nick Anim, who some of you know from Transition Town Brixton, uh, was presenting his green but mostly white research that he had done. And he said in an interview, always ask provocative questions like, why does diversity, inclusion and social justice matter to you? What do you understand community to be? My point of departure is Martin Luther King's assertion that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And once you understand why diversity, inclusion and social justice should matter, I think any initiative will stand a greater chance of prospering. So it's been a long journey and many of you have, have been there on all or part of that journey and nobody can claim the transition movement has excelled when it comes to inclusion and to just transition, but we're trying. And the same accusation can and often is made of the wider environmental movement too. But my sense is that over the last three or four years, particularly whether through the content in the transition to uh, in the Together We Can Summit and the Bounce Forward Summit or a whole range of other outputs, resources and alliances such as those mentioned above, and a cult uh, that a culture change is underway and a real commitment to doing an awful lot better, a shift of which this evening's event is a part. And I remember during the Bounce Forward Summit, which some of you will have attended online during COVID, when Marvina Newton from Black Lives Matter gave a very real challenge to the transition movement around just transition. And in one of the discussion groups that afterwards that I was a part of, it was clear that some groups, uh, some transitioners saw their work as being very much focused around just transition and collective liberation, and other groups saw it as being around community gardening. And as a self-organizing movement, our role at Transition Together is always to nudge and provoke and challenge, cajole and inspire new insights and ideas rather than somehow imposing them. A grassroots organization that is not, as a grassroots organization that's not centrally controlled, this challenge is one that is shared across everyone who steps into transition activism. And we must all be alive, I think, to the call of justice and collective liberation. So... Every community is different and inclusion looks different in every community and working towards and acting in solidarity with just transition looks different in each place. Building networks around solidarity, economic inclusion and justice looks different in Totnes and Brixton and Liverpool. But one of the beauties of a network like transition is the sharing of stories and ideas and inspiration that flows between initiatives. And this, this evening is very much in that vein.
And it's been fascinating to see in the last couple of years, transition groups emerging from initially community based projects and their energies like biker mutual aid in, in Newcastle upon time and sustainable starts focused on young families in Liverpool. And we take great heart from this. The movement for just transition is building with great momentum and it's thrilling to see the many ways in which the transition movement is beginning to be an active participant, an active companion that understands and takes its role seriously, as Rona will shortly start to sketch out. And I really hope this has been a useful reflection and contribution. And thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you, Rob, for cramming decades of context into five minutes. Very impressive. And loads of really valuable context in there. So helpful for framing this work. So thank you. Um, so welcome again. Um, I'm going to start by talking for just five or ten minutes about some context and definitions of just transition. Um, so that we can get some shared definitions and an understanding of what we're talking about, since as we learned from that word cloud, the phrase can mean so many different things to different people. Um, and then we're going to hear from our five wonderful contributors. So as I said, Rakesh, Pauline, Yaz, Rose and Steve have all joined us tonight. Um, and then we'll have a break in the middle where Rob is going to lead us in an imagination exercise and we'll have a short comfort break, hopefully around eight o'clock. And then we should have 20 minutes at the end to head into breakout rooms with one contributor in each room so that you can have the chance to ask questions and have a discussion in smaller groups. And we should be closing up around nine if we're good with our timings. Um, so hold us to that. So let's start with a little bit of history and context around just transition more widely. And then we'll talk specifically about where the transition movement fits into this bigger picture. Um, so the phrase just transition comes originally from the US labor and environmental justice movements. It comes out of the uniting of interests of trade unions and campaigners focused on environmental injustice. But it's also been widely and increasingly used in the UK, um, especially in Scotland, where there's actually a just transition commission at government level, um, as well as a really established grassroots, grassroots campaign. Um, and I personally first came across the phrase just transition when I lived in Aberdeen, where it's mostly used to refer to moving away from oil and gas um, without sacrificing the economic, social and cultural security of communities um, who rely on that industry. And I do really, really firmly believe that we can't separate calls for a just transition from workers' rights and from the important work that trade unions are doing. But I also feel really strongly that a just transition isn't only about workers and extractive industries. There's so much power in it being a call for transition in all industries and for the transformation of our economic, political and social systems at the same time. Um, I find the phrase transition is inevitable, justice is not really helpful here. Um, I imagine you might have come across it before. It refers to the fact that the climate, ecological and environmental crises mean that some kind of transition is going to happen, but there's no guarantee that it will lead to a more socially just world than the one that we have now. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the solutions um, which are being proposed or already enacted um, to reduce carbon emissions have consequences which lead to more injustice, more exclusion and more inequality at both national and international levels. But on a more positive note, at the same time, it's also a really exciting opportunity to do things differently. Um, we can use this inevitable transition as an opportunity to build futures which are more socially just, equitable and fair. So this is a really wordy but really interesting definition from the Climate Justice Alliance, who've been a big part in work around just transition in the US. I know it's long, but we are going to break it down. Um, they define just transition as a vision-led, unifying and place-based set of principles, processes and practices that build economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative one. Um, and thinking about it through a transition lens and kind of breaking it down a little bit. To me, vision-led means putting imagination at the heart, which I think we can all agree we're pretty good at. Um, unifying means seeing this as an opportunity for cohesion and for bringing folks together rather than entrenching divisions. Play-based means situating a just transition in communities and recognizing the value of acting at a local level. Again, something I think transition groups are already actively doing, or I know transition groups are already actively doing. Um, and using these three words, principles, processes, and practices, apart from being a tongue twister, um, means that just transition is both a set of values and an active and live process that we can participate in and contribute to. And then in terms of the last bit, the next slide is gonna expand a bit more on the meaning behind shifting from an extractive economy to a regenerative one. 
So I find this framework really helpful. It's also from the Climate Justice Alliance, but I do realize that the text is probably really small on your screens. <laughs> um, so don't worry if you can't read all of it, I'm gonna talk through it and we'll also send around these slides afterwards so you can kind of zoom in and have a closer look at it. Um, essentially, it frames just transition as something which involves stopping the harmful practices while simultaneously building alternatives. So looking at this kind of left side of the screen under extractive economy, um, this is unfortunately where most of the world is currently operating. Um, in this framework, they define an extractive economy as one with consumerism and colonialism as the core mindset, the enclosure of wealth and power being the main purpose, and extraction of resources being a core part of how the economy functions. So we have economic, political and social systems which are inherently exploitative both to the environment and to most communities. So just transition would combine the stopping of the system, and you can see over here, very small, it says stop the bad, um, stopping this system and the harm that it creates with building a regenerative system which prioritises both the rights of humans and the rights of the planet over profit and power. Um, so this arrow in the middle, it says on the left here, I don't know if you can read it, but it says stopping the bad, and it says building new on the right, and in the middle it says solutions that are visionary and oppositional. Um, so it's combining stopping the bad with building the new. And then on the right, um, under this regenerative economy setting, um, we have a regenerative economy with care at the centre, the purpose being ecological and social well-being, and the resource use model being based on regeneration. So in terms of where transition groups fit in, there's lots of groups in the UK who are already doing really important work around stopping the bad, including some transition groups like Transition Heathrow, who we're going to hear from um, a bit later. But I think where transition groups are especially well placed is in this role of building the new. So transition groups um, who we're going to hear from tonight, as well as hundreds of others, are actively creating regenerative economies in their communities and doing this role of building the new. And I'm sure we would all agree that our communities can act as microcosms to the rest of society. This means that initiatives at a local level have the power to enforce change on a larger scale, but it also means that forces of oppression in the rest of society can and do manifest at a community level. So alongside our work in building alternatives, we also need to acknowledge how they can replicate harmful systems and work on minimizing this. Yaz is gonna talk more about how this work um, fits into a just transition just later on tonight. So I think looking at it this way, we can see, and I'm, I've said it before and I will say it again, that just transition really is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to transform everything from the way we heat our homes to the way that we interact with people. And transition groups are really well placed to contribute to that. Um, I'm going to finish up soon, um, but I think first, it's really important to look at how we situate ourselves in the movement for a global just transition. Um, I'm sure you are all well aware that inequality in the UK is rising alongside global inequality. So recently, the UK Poverty Report for 2024 found that poverty in the UK has increased close to pre-pandemic levels. And just back in January, Oxfam's Inequality Report found that not only have 5 billion people globally become poorer since 2020, at the same time, the richest five men in the world have doubled their worth, and we could be on track to have the world's first trillionaire in the next 10 years, which is just insane. Um, and climate and environmental injustice add an extra dimension to this economic inequality, because the impacts of climate and environmental change aren't distributed evenly, as I'm sure we're all well aware. It's often the nations and communities who've done the least to contribute who suffer the most consequences. So campaigns for reparations, addressing the dual impacts of capitalism and colonialism and addressing power imbalances are all part of a global just transition. And I think it's really important to situate ourselves in this global. The really good news is that focusing on the change that we can make at a local level can have impacts internationally. And also that seeing ourselves as part of a worldwide movement for climate and environmental justice is really empowering. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Rakesh later about his work on decolonizing permaculture. Um, so I guess essentially what I'm saying is that just transition plus community-led change equals collective liberation. <laughs> um, I really wish it was that simple. <laughs> it's definitely not. And there's obviously much more to the picture. Um, but I do firmly believe that there's massive power in community-led change to be part of a just transition and contribute towards collective liberation. Transition groups and our wider communities have a really important role to play. Ultimately, I think the key to this is situating ourselves in a broader movement. Um, and thinking back to that framework that I shared a few slides ago, um, as the transition movement, we're only one part of that massive picture. But what we can do is work alongside and in active solidarity with 
groups, organizations, activists, trade unionists, and others who are all pushing and pulling at those levers of power to move us from an extractive economy to a regenerative one. I'm aware that this has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour or a big whistle-stop tour, but there's so much more um, to this. We'll have opportunities, I hope, to dive into some of the areas that we've touched on briefly in other spaces, um, but hopefully it's given us a little bit of a shared framework to start from. I think, unfortunately, we don't have time for clarifying questions, but if there's anything that didn't make sense to you, please feel free to put it in the chat and I'll do my best to respond in there. Um, but for now, I want to make sure we have plenty of time to hear from our five contributors who are all part of projects bringing Just Transition alive in their context. And they're going to give us some examples of how transition groups um, around the UK and Northern Ireland are contributing towards a Just Transition. So first, if he is here, I know he was having some tech issues, and um, we're going to hear from Rakesh. Can anyone confirm from me whether Rakesh has made it back? Uh, Yay. Yeah, I'm back again. Great, cool. I'll, um, do you want me to introduce you, Rakesh, or do you want to introduce yourself? Go for it. So Rakesh Rutsman rak is an experienced permaculture designer and teacher, forest garden specialist, and one of the founders of Transition Town ID, IG3 and Transition Upward. He's been growing food for 40 years, and he's been, been designing and teaching edible landscaping, permaculture, forest gardening, and more for the last 15 years. He's joining us to talk about a current project to gather stories around decolonizing permaculture. And he's also a member of the London and Southeast Transition Hub and the lead link for all international hubs to the Hub's Heart Circle. I will pass over to you, Rakesh, for your 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So, first of all, can you hear me properly? I've just moved to a new... Ah, wonderful. Yeah, so I'm currently in India, um, currently in Chennai, working with some really amazing people who are looking at, uh, well, we've been creating children's parliaments and neighbourhood opracy. Uh, so working with different neighbourhoods to using, utilising socioxy to really meet local people's needs. So it's been really, really incredible. But as you can imagine, uh, internet connection here is really terrible. Um, so first of all, I really want to say a huge thank you to um, the Transition Network for doing this work, because this is something that's been really close to my heart, as you can see that I'm, I'm not white, I'm not middle class. Uh, and since, uh, well, since the beginning of, of Transition Town, I, I wanted to, for example, to join Transition Brixton, um, which is close to where I was living at that time as Transition Brixton got started. And I found it very, very, very difficult to actually engage with them because more or less all of their meetups were in pubs, which for various cultural reasons, I don't go to pubs, mainly because people try to punch me whenever I walk into a pub. Uh, once they get drunk, I always end up as uh, someone trying to fight me. And so... <clears throat> So for various reasons, I've, I've felt Transition Town to be quite uh, not inclusive at all and not actually making an effort to include me. And this is not just Transition Town. This happens in the firm culture world, in global eco-village networks, in, in many, uh, or many groups that are looking at social uh, justice, talk continuously about this work, but actually actively just aren't really doing enough to actually really truly engage. Uh, so uh, this is something I'll be doing for the Practicing Transition group, actually starting to talk about how to really uh, include people, uh, how to really actively um, understand people's needs uh, who are on the margins, uh, who are not part of that same white middle class kind of background, because as, as Rob said in his introduction, Quite often, most of the people who come to Transition Town, who are attracted to Transition Town, are like the people who are already in Transition Town. And so, so this is my starting point. And within permaculture, one of the things that um, uh, I started to look at is some of the reasons as to why uh, permaculture is not um, fully accepted by many people in marginal, yeah, from marginal backgrounds. Uh, if we look at how permaculture started, it started uh, as, a, as a movement to look at how to, uh, in particular, grow food initially in a way that is environmentally friendly, but in a way that is uh, fossil fuel free. 
Um, and it was done by studying uh, nature, how nature creates, creates in um, uh, richness and abundance. It were they then you know by studying how nature did that how nature creates all these nutrient cycles and you know how no entity within the ecosystem is too greedy everything understands you know uh, how to understand its limits and within that ecosystem so that everything can thrive and diversity and all the rest of it so they then designed ways in which food around uh, match. Yeah, hang on, there's something clearly missing, which is the um, the drive for why people would want to do this. And so then they started looking at different cultures for how they mentality that allowed them to really um, you know, to, to take care of themselves, take care of others, as well as take care of their environment. So from that they extracted ethics. So permaculture is based on ethics and understanding how uh, nature creates richness and abundance and picking out a whole bunch of principles uh, that can then be used to design ecosystems. So, and as we know, Rob's, um, many of us will know Rob's story of how he was teaching permaculture and then started to deeply look at, well, how do we bring permaculture into urban environments rather than it just being the usual Beardy weirdies, um, you know, who are out in rural parts of the world. Um, and I include myself as a beardy weirdy, um, even, <laughs> even if I'm, I'm not white middle class. Um, so its roots, permaculture's roots are really deeply stemmed in understanding cultural practices from all over the world, from, you know, indigenous peoples all over, whether it's white people, you know, uh, who may nowadays be classified as pagan and very backwards or whatever, you know, classified as somehow being anti-Christian or whatever. And, you know, uh, you know anyone who was deemed someone who understood herbs and medicines was clearly a witch needs to be eradicated. You know, it comes from people around, around Asia, around Africa, and actually studying their, their practices for how they lived in an environmentally friendly way. And so, as, but the whole system was put together by um, Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, who are two white Australians, but they very, very, very clearly expressed how they got to understand this. They were very clear on saying this came from understanding many, many, many different uh, um, peoples from around the world. However, now, because the majority of the permaculture teachers are white middle class and male as well, um, the way in which it's portrayed to the world is quite often, ah, oh, this is a white person's uh, prerogative, you know. So when you go to places like India, um, you know, first of all, India lived completely within its means. Uh, it had, it was, you know, it, always, you know, up to about 30 or 30 years ago, it wouldn't import almost anything. Everything was completely self-contained. So culturally, they knew how to live within their means. However, colonialism came along and said, what are you doing it that way for? That's stupid. That's crazy. You should do it this way. In fact, it wasn't even that nice. It was kind of at the end of a gun, kind of saying, if you don't do it this way, then, uh, yeah, you have no life left. We will kill you. So in many parts of the world, um, in many parts of the world, colonialization completely changed uh, people's abilities to practice what they were doing for thousands of years um, at the expense of the people. Um, and now you've got more whiteness you know, so at the hands of white people being told your practices are ridiculous, they're stupid, do it our way. Now, all of a sudden, we've got more well-to-do white middle-class people coming back to India and Asia saying, what are you doing it that way for? You should be doing it like this, permaculture. And so you can understand there's a huge distrust. Here we go again, more colonialists trying to tell us what we should be doing. So my work is to try and see how we can rebuild and, and collect a whole bunch of stories 
that very clearly show that actually the roots of permaculture uh, and a lot of the inspiration comes from indigenous peoples all around the world, white, uh, not and not just you know uh, uh, people of different colors, but including European cultures. So um, so yeah. So what I'm doing now is I'm collecting stories. I've just created a spreadsheet or a, a Google form where we can start accepting uh, stories from people. We will then start to present it um, once we've collected it. And the idea is that the next permaculture convergence. I, uh, the next te permaculture teachers conversions, I should say, I'll be presenting this work again to the teachers to say, hey, here's some, in here's some inspiring stories. Here's some inspiring stories that you can tell while you're teaching permaculture to show that it's not, uh, you know, to really show that the roots of where permaculture came from. So I have to admit, it's been quite slow in terms of many people saying, wow, this is amazing. This is fantastic, really love your work, really support you. I, I'm going to send you some stories, and then nothing happens. And I think so far I've had two, maybe three stories out of about 40, 50 different permaculture teachers who have said they will contribute things. So, so the work is slow, um, but I'm not giving up. I'm, you know, and while I'm here in India, I'm collecting lots of stories, which I will upload myself. Uh, some really, really, really inspiring stories that really encapsulate, you know, the roots of permaculture. So, um, I say it's it's kind of in a way, uh, and, you know, very. Uh, I'm losing my words here, but it's very descriptive of some of the problems that we face, where many people want uh, to do something, but there's, you know, we we're so we lack so much time. And maybe people's five, you know, priorities aren't necessarily always there. Sometimes it's just about survival. I think Rakesh is going to drop off because of the time difference. Um, so I won't be in a breakout room. Um, but there's contact details in the chat if you want to get in touch with Rakesh, Rakesh and discuss his work anymore. Um, thank you so much, Rakesh. That was a well winter in 10 minutes. Really appreciate it. Okay, um, we are going to pass over to Pauline now. Um, Pauline is a community organiser and mental health practitioner working in social and environmental justice in Belfast. Um, she's currently involved in community growing, nature-based well-being, supporting those impacted by migration and building sustainable communities in community initiatives through her work with different organisations, including Grow Community Gardens, Participation and Practice of Rights and Anaka Women's Collective. Um, I'm going to pass over to Pauline, who I think has some slides to share with us as well. So as Rona said, I'm Pauline and I work in uh, Belfast. Um, and I've been working at Grow Community Gardens for about six years now. And uh, just listening to all the, you know, the talk of transition, um, I suppose we didn't think of ourselves in those terms until recently. <laughs> and uh, I'm surprised, well, I mean, we just, everything we do fits uh, what we're talking about this evening. So <clears throat> can you see those slides okay? Yeah, um, I'm going to, I've got a, a timer set here, so I'm just going to start it. Um, you'll keep me right anyway, guys. But Grow, um, we're a community garden that kind of started up on an interface. An interface in the Belfast context means it's on a line between a Catholic and a Protestant nationalist um unionist community in north in north of the city and we're just on the edge of a public park and we got a, a lease on a site there a piece of kind of neglected land where really um missiles were thrown across walls and uh, and so we we got a lease on the land and have turned it into a really beautiful oasis and since then since 2008 we've been kind of pushing the boundaries and testing out what's possible on this piece of marginal land and four other sites across northwest and east Belfast. Primarily, we're about growing food and creating biodiverse spaces. Um, and then as as we've kind of evolved, we've realized that um that in order to include a diverse um a diversity of people in our spaces, we have to then also take um a very active uh 
with you on the work. So we've been kind of developing uh, how we do that over the last six years in particular. We're about connecting people with each other, with nature and with themselves and providing really practical ways for people to build skills and confidence and connections and opportunities for action at a, at a really local level um, and then impacting on people's physical and mental health as a result but really working with communities on the margin so address really working with communities who are experiencing poverty isolation and um, physical and mental health uh, difficulties and newcomer communities as well most of the communities where we work are um communities that have multiple deprivation going on they there's a lot of poverty um and um and then people you know newcomer communities coming in into those communities and experiencing the the kind of shift and dynamics that that creates and and the tensions that it creates and the opportunities as well um and always coming from the perspective that the people uh, who are on the margins will be most impacted by climate breakdown and biodiversity loss, um, and that the, these two things are not separate. <clears throat> How we do our work, um, we have a particular model which really it, it involves um, community gardeners supporting um, uh, weekly sessions mostly usually about two hours in safe spaces so we meet up weekly the groups might be open there might be a lot of coming and going but a lot of our groups are closed so we're creating very safe spaces where people will get very bonded and um and the groups are diverse and the spaces are diverse each of our five spaces that we work in has its own personality and that's very much kind of dictated by the community that we're working with um Okay, so that's repeating myself there, sorry. Um, just thinking about how we work um, for this presentation and and kind of, again, have a lot of echoes with what other people are saying tonight, but that we're an inter we, we work in an intersectional way and we take a kind of a systems approach, an ecological systems approach, but also social systems. Um, we're very much a grassroots organization focusing on the margins. We're collaborative and connected and trauma-informed. And just go, to go say a bit more about those, um, uh, when I say we're intersectional, it's it's understanding and really uh, this informing the work that racism, migration, poverty and class and gender are all part of the story of climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. And that in harming nature, we're harming ourselves and in healing nature, we're healing ourselves. So that in uh, I see you sh shaking your hand there, Richard. What does that mean again? You're right <laughs> About five minutes or have about four minutes no, left? No, no, no. I'm really sorry. I was trying to just applaud you. What you All right, okay. Silently. <laughs> and of course, it's from the exact opposite, Pauline. I beg your pardon. Oh, no bother. No bother at all. Um, and again, just saying that the, each of the five spaces that we occupy are, are so, so different and so diverse and have their own personalities because they're led by people in those communities. Um. Our focus on the margins, um, again, coming from ecological and social terms, edge zones are places where things happen against the odds with limited resources and under harsh conditions. And um, if I was to say we are in between funders at the moment, um, we, uh, we're operating against the odds with limited resources and under harsh conditions, uh, like probably lots of people here. But also the communities that we're, that we're working with are experiencing all of those challenges. Um, and we see that the gardens are spaces where we can test out what's possible and, and show what's possible and sort of uh, like a prefigurative revolution, really. Um, and sorry, this is quite slow moving on here. Collaborative and connected. So the, you know, the, the principle of being stronger together, really knowing that and feeling it and experiencing it and how we work. Um, so our water work site, that, that was our first site that we worked on. That's kind of developed into a demonstration of what's possible. It's off grid, you know. We we um we we build things there. We've got solar panels. We've got a uh, uh we've built an earth oven there. We do traditional building skills, and we've got a um a, an edible landscape there as well. So that's kind of where we show what's possible. And then our other spaces, kind of, um we bring them in on what we're doing there and. When we move into other spaces, we do it when we're invited. We go in listening, um, and and really 
working out who's doing what in those communities and working very closely with them and putting our skills at their service. So some of the groups that we work with are Anaka Women's Collective, which um, works with women and families who are impacted by the asylum system. Um, and I don't really have time to go into that, but that's just been such an amazing uh, collaboration for us, such an amazing learning. Um, and uh, and an ongoing piece of work as well. Uh, a really lovely collaboration for us and, and one that kind of opened our world up really is with PPR, the Participation and Practice of Rights, their human rights organization, um, whose approach really was about holding power to account. Um, and you know, they'd get small wins and and uh, and and get places through freedom of information requests and, and the usual kind of human rights approaches. But what we've been able to bring to them is uh, again, you know, testing out what's possible and creating the, you know, actually creating the vision of the future that we want to see. What they've brought for us is a whole uh, social justice analysis and an ability to tell a story, um, which we never had. The, the experience or skills to do before. So it's been a really powerful collaboration. And then those are other uh, collaborations that we're involved in. I don't really have time to go into them, but um, just to say that uh, a lot of our work, again, like I say, is on marginal pieces of land. They're all urban, inner city, a lot of them. And uh, across the cultural divide of Catholic Protestant, but also bringing in actively including um, uh, people from different cultures um, and then and also collaborating with universities that's more of a recent thing we've found some really good partners in there um, so that we're bringing research to, again to the service of the community and, and vice versa uh, with PPR we're involved in a, in a land justice campaign so it came from their uh, campaign on homelessness um, and it was very much a homelessness campaign that they had and our involvement has kind of influenced it and changed it into a more of a land justice campaign and a vision for um, ecologically, financially and socially sustainable communities in the context of Belfast and the cultural divides that have that still exist. Um, OK, so I can't actually see my head in here oh yes yeah. so we work in a trauma-informed way and just been really cognizant of the fact that we're in a post-conflict society you might even feel post for some of the people who are involved in some of the communities we work with and also to acknowledge the trauma and migration related trauma that a lot of our people um have experienced as well just getting to hear and being involved in the asylum system the hostile environment that's purposely created for people um so we really uh, emphasize safe spaces, the development of relationships and um, the choice so people can decide what they want to do and how they want to do it and when they want to do it. A strong sense of collaboration and empowerment um, and celebrating diversity. Can't actually see the bottom of my screen there, but um, and that's us. We've built the, these earth ovens. Everybody loves an earth oven. And it's been a really lovely way for us to just to finish up by saying um, it really grounds us in the spaces we're in. So anywhere in Belfast, pretty much if you go down two feet, there's clay. Um, so we've taken clay out of the soil, really got to know the soil in each different place um, and used it to build these earth ovens, which are such a, a beautiful um uh, kind of connector socially and uh, and environmentally as well like it just teaches us so much about the environment so just wanted to put that in there and it's about lighting fires you know finding people's spark and lighting those fires and keeping them burning so that's that's me well wow, thank you Pauline so much stuff there and so much love in the chat as well and you were perfectly on time that is a skill in itself <laughs> thank you so much um, I'm going to pass on now um, to our third contributor, who is Yaz, um, who is my colleague at Transition Together um, and is part of the Transition Together team, as well as nurturing our online community on Vibe. Um, so you probably will have seen them in that online space. Um, they've been supporting our work of weaving social justice and collective liberation into all that we do in addition to that work. Um, and I'm going to pass to Yaz. Thank you. Um... I'm just taking a moment still just to um, 
process all of the wondrous stuff we just heard from Pauline in Belfast. I just feel quite moved and inspired to hear about the project works that you've been doing there. So, um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I'm going to bring it back a little to what we're doing here at Transition Together and how that relates to the wider work around transition that, that we're all um, involved in. So an important element of the work of, of transition, as, as Rob mentioned in the opening, has been a recognition that our inner and our outer worlds are entwined. So that means making outer systemic changes must also involve some kind of inner shifts. This is what we might know as inner transition, developed by Sophie Banks and others, drawing from a broad range of study and cultural traditions, and which continues to be developed by transitioners all over the world. So we might understand inner transition as being about creating healthy culture or all levels of scale. Our personal culture, our group culture, and the culture within communities, movements, the world, and ecosystems more generally. Alongside this, a key principle of just transition is equitable redistribution of power and resources, building new systems that are good for all people and not just a few. And this involves understanding and then transforming current and historic social inequities based on things such as race, class, gender, ability, and multiple other forms of oppression. We're all socialised by and live and work in systems and institutions that have deeply embedded oppression at their core. Some of us are marginalised by these systems, while others are privileged by them, which can make this work challenging, but is also why it's deeply necessary. Because whether we're conscious of it or not, all of these systems will show up in us. They'll show up in how we relate to each other, in who participates in our groups, in whose ideas we build projects around, how we make decisions together, and how we experience and behave during periods of conflict. A key practice of the transition movement is coming together in our communities to imagine new futures sowing the seeds and creating the conditions for those new futures to come alive in the here and now. And at the same time, systems of oppression are setting limits and policing who does and doesn't belong, what is and isn't the right way to be or the right way to live. So without shining a light on inequities, we actually limit the potential and the potency of our visions for the future what we can reimagine and how we rebuild our world together. When in our team, we set out on the path of exploring what a just transition might look like at a community level, it was clear that we couldn't just focus on delivering training resources and events without ourselves inwardly looking at systems of oppression and power imbalances and how they will even exist in, in, in ourselves and also in us as a staff team because that will affect then what we put out into the world. We want to ensure that we're integrating just transition principles into our work holistically, and that means exploring it from the inside out. So this isn't solely about how we might behave and act in ways that aren't oppressive. It's not just about saying the right words in the right places. This is much more deeply about how we can build more humanizing communities how we can practice limitless imagination in the ways that we might want our communities to look, to be fed, to have energy, to move around. So last week, the Transition Together team embarked on an anti-oppression learning journey led by a collective called HELD. And over the next four months, as a team, we'll be learning together about systems of oppression, identity and power, relationship dynamics, tools of oppression, as well as anti-oppressive and liberatory practices. We're doing this through a series of deep dive conversations, supported with resources and activities along the way to expand our learning and, and, and understanding. We're doing it over four months. It's um, 
uh, six sessions over four months, but we wanted to allow for a spaciousness between those sessions to allow us for greater personal reflection and, and more opportunity to really integrate the learning. And our experience so far of being held by held has been that we've been held with dignity, care, compassion, expertise and humility. It's created a container for us to be to be brave in this work together. We hope to go deep. We hope to support each other, learn more about ourselves, our dynamics and our culture. And, and most importantly for all of you, we're going to be weaving what we uncover and learn into all of the work that we do in supporting the transition movement to reimagine and rebuild our world. Thanks. Thank you, Yes, Really appreciate the work you put into collating that for us. Um, so much value in that reminder that anti-oppression has to be a core cool part of any just transition work. Um, I'm going to pass over to Rob now, who's going to lead us in an imagination exercise, um, which you may or may not have done before. Um, Rob will explain how it works, and then afterwards we'll go into a short break. Well, hello again, everybody. Yes, you uh, you all know, I imagine, that actually the transition movement started here uh, in Totnes in Devon, where I'm speaking to you from today. And you may know many different things about Totnes as a place. But what you probably don't know is that we're also home to the UK's first successful time travel program uh, and have built the world's first successful time machine. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as a sort of Cape Canaveral uh, of time travel. And the big uh, time machine that we built is great, but uh, it's a bit after Brexit, it was very hard to get an export license uh, for a time machine. So our team worked on a different model, which means you can turn any space into a time machine and it's this little uh, unassuming little box but inside there is some serious quantum stuff going on in this box and uh, and it allows us to uh, step outside of the present and to travel to different futures because there are many many an infinite number of different futures the future is often presented to us as if it's one uh, fixed thing but there are an infinite number of futures that we can still aim for and strive for so this is a little exercise where i'm going to invite you to uh to make yourself comfortable and feel the ground uh, underneath your feet and to just close your eyes and in a second i'm going to I've set this for 2030 and I will turn it on and we'll just take a couple of minutes to sit in silence. And the invitation is for you in your imagination, using all of your senses. What does it smell like, feel like, sound like, taste like? If you were to step in out of the time machine into the future in which your local community, your local transition group is practicing just transition. It runs through everything. It runs through the DNA of what you do. So to just step out, take a walk around. We'll take a couple of minutes just to sit in silence so that you can go on a little uh, walk of the imagination around that world in 2030. And then we'll come back and we'll share how that was. So I'm going to turn it on now. And uh, you should feel yourself being picked up out of 2024 and then drop down into 2030. And we'll come back in about, and we'll just, I'll call you back in about a minute and a half and we'll hear your reflections on how that was. So enjoy 2030. It's amazing. You're going to love it.
Okay, I'm going to I'm going to gently call you back to 2024. Sorry, uh, and it would be lovely just if we could for a minute or, or two before we stop for a break, it's just to drop some impressions into the chat. Just even one or two words. What did you see? What did you feel? Anything that surprised you? Anything that touched you? Any impressions that you'd like to share with us would be really, really lovely to see. be shy inclusivity and grassroots thank you sophie quieter streets people talking so quiet i could hear the birds appreciation and love of where we are now green abundant healthy communities thank you michelle it's so green there people instead of cars local community hubs for transport in my 2030 power is shared and cared for so much more equitably no billionaires absolutely as alexandra Ocasio cortez said back in 2022 every billionaire is a policy failure i saw visions of grow belfast type projects popped up everywhere green space at the end of my road that currently has a sign saying keep off the grass was a lush garden with people meeting, growing food, playing. The community economy is thriving. Buses and active travel networks allow the margins and the centre to reconnect with two-way traffic, still removing the act bad actors from the system, but they're finding easier to find and act against. Feelings of positive outlook, hopefulness rather than stress. Green and happy. Public bike, free public bike libraries, central solar farms, huge allotments. We opened a community environment centre in late 23 in Tesco's. It seems so big. Now we have six of them. Trees, trees, trees. It smelled like a bright spring day. Thank you, everybody, so much. Chaos on learning, sharing in new ways. Food growing everywhere. Curiosity and wonder. Thank you so much. It's an exercise that uh, maybe we... So it's an exercise that I do a lot, and I've done it with one and a half thousand people in a hall, and it's such an interesting thing because it connects us into what the things that bring happiness and contentment rather than short-term pleasure and dopamine, which is what so much of our economy is built around. And there is actually, just to finish, there is a guide that was produced by Transition Together on how to do that exercise in different settings and in different ways and with different sized groups of people, which maybe Rich could could pop into the chat uh, so that you could do it as well. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for time traveling with me. We are going to get going with our next two contributors. Um, so Rose is a community organiser and touring musician working with communities across the UK and Europe to share stories of social change and song. She's part of Transition Heathrow, helping to protect the Heathrow villages from demolition due to the third runway and bring life, hope and support to these villages that have been so blighted by the aviation industry and that threat of expansion. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Rose and Rose, just let me know when you want me to change the slides. Amazing, thank you. Um, just to check that I can see the slides as well. Ah, there we go, beautiful. Okay, I'm also here with Sophie. We've actually been traveling over land and sea to the south of Spain where we are in the mountains in a, a yoga shala that we've been helping to plaster. So it's a bit dusty, bit window open. Um, so the first slide that you can see is uh, loads of baby trees. Um, lots of which we planted in Heathrow. So a lot of people think that Heathrow, of course, is just an airport, whereas actually there's five villages in Heathrow. Um, and of course, a lot of these villages have been hugely affected by the airport and the threat of the expansion. Um, and there was more villages that now aren't there. Um, the airport is in their place. Um, yeah, and so... Of course, that affects the villages in many different ways. There's very high levels of pollution, of course, air pollution, noise pollution, like higher rates of diseases due to those things. And um, 
also some sad stories about development that often happens in this way with, with big capitalist developments and um, communities getting pushed out of their own homes, which we've seen more and more over recent years and different people have experienced, not only in cities, of course, in countryside too. Um, and so, for example, one of the villages, Sipson, um, where I lived in a big community occupation that I'll tell you more about in a moment, um, now BA, British Airways, owns, I think, at least over 70, 80 percent of the properties there and have kind of bullied people out of their homes and rents them out on a short term tenant basis. So stopping, um, trying to stop any kind of community from existing there. Um, so maybe we can move on to the next slide. Um, see which one we've got. So this is some beautiful pictures of Grow Heathrow, um, where I went to live when I was actually about 18 and it was kind of my university. We learned um, so much creating this community space on occupied land in the village of Sips and in Heathrow, um, growing our own food and basically clear, we cleared out about 30 tons of rubbish. Um, and reopen this, the land up as a community space that anyone could come to any time, anyone was welcome, a lot of local support, John McDonald's, our local MP, and um, also, of course, as well as working with all the local villages, there was uh, many activists that kind of came from far and wide to support uh, the local people of Heathrow, basically. And some of these photos, you can see some of the kind of things we got up to. So um, building solar panels, we built a wind turbine, growing food, foraging, doing lots of community arts, and of course, lots of community well-being and conflict resolution, these kind of things that you have to learn also in communities. Um, so sadly, that bit of land, which was there, the community for over 10 years, around 10 years, um, the last bit of that land was evicted at the end of the pandemic. Um, but luckily, we had already started up a community arts organisation so that we could work more easily with local schools, especially um, a permaculture organisation. And we have kept that going so that we can continue working, especially with the schools in Heathrow and the Heathrow villages. And also some of those trees that you saw that we planted um, that are still growing. Um, one site, especially in another Heathrow village called Harmonsworth. Um, this year, we've been building a garden in one circle of trees that we planted next to the Harmonsworth Primary School, also next to a detention center, also, of course, very near the airport and the motorway. So it's quite a unusual mix of things in Heathrow people battling with a lot. Um, maybe we can go on the next slide and see what we've got. So there are some of the um, arts projects we've been doing and the garden, the circle of trees that we were doing this year and uh, a mural in Harlington, which is another one of the Heathrow villages with local people and a, and a community parade that we did with um, children from the villages making flags around the theme of homes for Heathrow as a home, not just an airport. And um, in, the, in the picture of the garden, we've got Anchor who can't be there today, but uh, here with us today, but... Um, We've been working on connecting with um, the communities in Heathrow and in Harmonsworth, especially there's a very strong South Asian community and just making sure that the children in the schools also feel like there are people that they can relate to, you know, um, on many different levels. So working with the local children and adults through arts and growing um, and all the, you know, the many good things that we do as transition. Just checking my timing. So um, I'm going to introduce Sophie as well because we're here together. So maybe you want to say hi. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah nice. Thanks, Rose. Um, so I'm Sophie. Um, I am part of um, PAM, so Permaculture Action Mentors, um, something that we've set up that is um, basically an umbrella for helping young people. Um, so I have a background in outdoor education and the arts as well um, and definitely found one of the most incredible parts of bringing kids into nature through residential camps, through um, outdoor activity and just basically engaging with nature was the connection and community that they felt together and especially kids coming out of the cities and knowing that this is accessible to them. Um, accessibility is 
the most important thing. Um, you know, art is seen as something that is um, reserved for people with money or people in certain demographics. And this is not the case. Art is everywhere. Art is heart. Um, and everyone should have accessibility to that. So yeah, permaculture action mentors, you know, we're, we're creating all sorts. We're creating land working festivals as well. We've got one land um, that is, we've held that sort of retreats as well as um, getting people into land working spaces um, with a focus on workshops and music and just knowing that it's possible, um, knowing that this is out there because people need hope and people need to be able to know that it's possible for them to go and engage in these product in these projects so yeah amazing exactly and so one thing so if you mentioned was the one land that we've been creating which is basically bringing people together on the land to help people connect with the land um in whatever form that might be and that's one of the events that we've been doing this year at Heathrow in Heathrow and um last year and now we're in 2024 not 2034 yet, um, but hopefully those trees will still be there. And um, yeah, bringing both local people in Heathrow and people supporting activists, environmental activists, but maybe more now we've come into this stage of understanding how important intersectionality is, of course, in transition in the wider environmental movement, um, bringing these different um, communities, wider communities together of environmental activists, but also of artists. So we bring together lots of musicians and artists also to support and link with the environmental work that's going on. So obviously we need all of us, we need all these communities to be working together at this stage. Um, probably coming to our time, let's see what slides we've got left on there out of interest. We can whiz through the last one. So there's a few more of uh, another mural that we've done in Heathrow and um, one of our big uh, celebrations, Heathrow, I think it was the Heathrow Heathrow 10th birthday, that one. And we played lots of music and did our classic cake competition. Um, maybe we can whiz onto the next slide. So that was a bike powered bus that we cycled from uh, South London to Heathrow, collecting people's visions that uh, we had done a project over a year, collecting people's visions about um, what they might want to spend 17 billion pounds on if they could, because that was how much the third runway was costed at. Um, and then we cycled all the visions to Heathrow on this bike powered bus. Let's go on the next slide and see what we've got. I think that's, so, that's it. Okay, perfect. That's great. I'm glad that um, we've got through them. <laughs> uh, I wonder how, how, mu how much time have we got left? A few minutes? You have one minute left, but if you want to... One minute. That's okay. Perfect, that's perfect. So, yeah, I guess just... I know we said we... Uh, I think maybe you shared the Music for Unity page. And, um, yeah, also there's... I don't... If people don't use Instagram, there is a Music for Unity website. It's Music for Unity with a four. And that brings together lots of artists, musicians, and also land working, stuff we're doing in Heathrow. Um, yeah, and and I know I said at the beginning when you guys asked not to share my personal music, but maybe that's a nice thing because I do share lots of stories and songs about Heathrow and these projects. So if you do want to find more about that, you can. I'm kindly um, Sophie's letting me on her Zoom because my mind didn't mind stop working, but um, it, that's under uh, Rose Music, uh, Rose Music UK is the website. But maybe you can share that as a link as well. But yeah, thank you all for hosting because it's so important that we have these conversations and for sure we're getting there but for sure we've got a long way to go as well and we'll see of course the big stuff that's going on in the world and where that takes us and how that encourages us to look at some of these deeper issues and how we really can come out of our kind of classic boxes of communities and go through these and, and challenge ourselves to share and connect with each other in, in new ways, which we'll be, we will for sure be challenged with in the future. And hopefully, I'm sure we'll meet those challenges. So yeah, I think that's it from us. <laughs> Thank you again. Great. Thank you so much, Rose. And what a great example of that stopping the bad while, while simultaneously building the new. It's like you were doing all of it in one group. Um, I'm going to pass now to Steve. Um, who is our last contributor and the founder and member of Community Roots, um, Bolton, whose goal as a community project is to address food poverty and to include working class people in the fight against climate change. 
They do this by employing permaculture ethics and principles in our community development, in their community development and educational work. So I'll stop screen sharing so that we can see Steve. Right. So a little bit about my background. Um, I'm Steve. I was born in Salford in uh, Great Manchester. And I grew up in some quite rough, impoverished areas. Um, I was actually born in a tower block in Salford that was named after, uh, ironically, after the, the poet and illustrator William Blake. And when I left school at 16, Margaret Thatcher had been in power for one year. So the idea of jobs for life had completely gone by that time. Um, I wasn't very interested in anything the Labour movement had to offer. Um, I wanted I wanted adventure. And because I've been a punk rocker in the sort of early era and post-punk era, um, I got into all sorts of stuff. Um, anarchism, environmentalism, and I found all this very exciting. So to fast forward a little bit, throughout much of the 80s, I was fat part of the free festival circuit, um, and we were sort of labelled in a derogatory manner as New Age Travellers. And then in the 90s, um, I spent six years in a punk reggae band, and uh, this was a very multicultural affair. We had two Jamaican guys in the band, myself from Salford, a guy from South Manchester and a Northern Irish guy on the keyboard. So we were a right mixture and people didn't really know how to take us. Middle class and working class people at venues thought we were a bit peculiar. So that was quite a good thing in a way. So a lot of what happened in that in those two decades really inspired and gave me a bit of an outlook in, uh, in life. So let's fast forward a little bit. So... Me and my partner had a conversation in the early 2000s in our back garden about the fact that hardly anybody on our estate could afford to buy organic vegetables. Most people on our estate at the time were either on very low income or were unemployed. And it just seemed completely unfair and unethical that people couldn't afford to buy something as rudimentary and simple as cleanly grown vegetables. So we set about trying to deal with this in the most practical way we could. And this involved, um, my partner applied for some money from the Hindu Forum. And uh, she worked with six really skint families who were really struggling with uh, all sorts of multiple deprivation issues. And that was our first ever project that we delivered. So part of that growing kit was a raised bed, soil, plug plants, uh, lots of seeds, and then a once a week visit for sort of help with gardening, horticulture issues, etc. And... We could kind of see that this this sort of had some momentum, this, and um, it, had, it was beginning to form a thread. So a couple of years later, uh, I was a mental health program tutor. The, um, the job was cut short by conservative cuts to provision. So after that job ended, I went back to the job and I delivered a community food growing project for people with mental health issues. That went round down really well. I did that for around eight months. And then we had another opportunity. We met um, we met a guy who was a community development worker in a local pub, and he just he said to us rather playfully, he said, "Why don't you speak to the landlord and see if he'll let you use the tennis court in his grounds to grow food on?" So, being game for a laugh and also half serious as well, I approached the landlord. Two weeks later, we were on a clay tennis court making raised beds and growing food. And for the next three years, all the food that we grew there was going to the YMCA. It was going to um, a long running project in Bolton that fed refugees and asylum seekers. And we grew plenty of food using um, organic horticulture and permaculture methods. And then another opportunity arose when we were contacted out of the blue by somebody from NACRO, criminal justice organisation. So we went over to East Manchester and I spent a whole summer and what I did was um, I broke down components of permaculture. I took all the intellectual stuff away and I delivered it as very practical sessions every week to long-term serious offenders, people who were armed robbers with substance misuse issues. That went down really well. Um, we were invited back and we did a little bit more with them, but inevitably we had to move on. So uh, I was approached by somebody from a housing charity in Bolton, a guy called Tony, quite a forward-thinking guy who grew his own food. And I ended up working with him for six years, and we worked with 25 families every year growing food on this really skint council estate. 
And um, the amusing element was it was three or four was dragging this old B&Q trolley around the estate full of resources every week. And people sort of recognised us and, you know, people would be asking for plants and soil and seeds. So it sort of had its own momentum because we were out on the streets. We weren't part of an organisation. We, we were just like the people who lived on the estates. So that there was an element of trust there. We did that for six years. We planted around 200 fruit trees on this estate in various locations in people's gardens. We did a little bit of guerrilla gardening, which was a bit naughty, but hey-ho. And while we were working with this housing charity, we also developed two hubs and menning sheds group that also grew food. And we worked with refugee men and helped them out, helped them to grow food. And another project, which is around a five-minute walk from where we live, also food growing. Uh, we delivered introductions to permaculture there. And a lot of men who attend this project have mental health issues. So lockdown came and we thought, how can we work within lockdown? And then this little light bulb went on. And that little light bulb was permitted exercise. So me and my partner loaded the car up with um, edible plants and we drove around the estate. And we used permitted exercise time to drop plants off at people's houses. And we put them at the bottom of the gardens, just behind the gate. And we had our own Facebook group called Food Growers of Bolton. And we just sort of said to people, if, um, if you need any advice or tips on growing, contact us through this Facebook group. That went down really well. The group's still going now. We've got around 450 members. And then shortly as we were coming out of lockdown, um, I, I, I met an old friend, um, Alan from Bolton Diggers, who uh, a food a food group that had existed for around 22, 23 years. And they also help people to grow food, people on low, low or no income, uh, asylum seekers, refugees, basically anybody that's struggling. Now, Alan had quite a sizable chunk of around a quarter of an acre of land that he let us use for absolutely nothing on his site. So we applied for funding from World for All, set a polytunnel up, and we're in year two. And all the food, we, we grew masses of food. We, we gave the food to people who attended the project. We gave it to refugee projects, to homeless projects. And then uh, I can remember reading something on Transition Together about the seed funding. So we applied we applied for funding for a fruit tree project. And the idea initially was to plant 70 fruit trees um, on the council estate where we actually live. We ended up planting 85 fruit trees and 85 bushes simply by knocking on people's doors and saying, all right, do you want a fruit tree? And they'd either say yes or no. We developed some great relations with the local Muslim community while we were doing this. Um, and they brought us close to tears by saying, you know, the work that you're doing is a very, very selfless act and it's really beautiful. And we were offered food and drinks every time we stopped to um, work with Muslim families, which was absolutely amazing. So let's fast forward to right now. We're... Um, We've, applied, we've been successful in applying for transitions, seed funding again. And I'm just waiting at the moment for the payment to go into my bank account. And I'm actually watching close on 400,000 vegetable and fruit seeds on eBay, which I'm getting ready to purchase. As soon as that check hits my account, I'm going to buy those seeds and we're going to be all over Bolton at different locations, working with families, community groups, individuals, people in streets, anybody who will entertain us. And we're going to take our little kits with us, loads of seeds, seed trays, compost, and we're going to try and get the whole town growing. We've also got funding to buy around 50 fruit trees and 50 fruit bushes out of this. So that's what we're doing. And we find that because there's no, there isn't really anything in the statutory domain that recognises that there's a need for a food culture in working class communities. There's loads of people using food banks, um, the stuff that you get from food banks isn't that nutritious, really. You know, I think I think it's great that the food's available. It's keeping people alive, but there's a lot of sweet, heavy carbohydrate stuff. So we think this thing of having fresh food and giving people access to fresh food is likely to have um, a good effect on the health, basically, and they're going to learn new skills. They're going to learn how to grow food. Um, in many cases, how to get on with the neighbours who... They've either not spoken to at all or they've just sort of mumbled the odd thing in, in passing. And to characterise our group, I'm not sure how close towards the, the 10 minutes I am, 
but I'd say community community roots food growing project is fighting inequality through growing food. It's about permanent change. It's about inclusion. It's about sharing knowledge from different cultures, different time areas, different places, bringing people together. And also it's about having a good laugh and joy and being human. And it's really easy to do this. And I've kind of, over the last sort of 15 years, on and off, it's been my job. Um, rather than being cooped up in some crappy office, I'd rather take a year, apply for funding, um, live, live on subsistence wages, grow food, forage food, but actually get out there into the community and try and make this permanent difference that we really, really need. And uh, I think particularly for in, in the last two, I've always admired the transition movement, but in the last few years, um, we've got absolutely no complaints as a working class group. They've um, they've hit all the spots with us, um, and we're now a transition group, which I'm rather proud of, and people can access us. Anybody in our area can access our services and come and work with us. We've got decades and decades of skills, and we run courses all the time. I mean, we're, we're running a guerrilla gardening course in a few weeks' time. We're going to be running introductions to permaculture uh, all throughout the summer, um, making earth ovens, rocket stoves, lots of quirky, interesting stuff that brings people together, that saves people money and that saves people the planet. And I'm not sure what, what else to say, really. And I mean, what our, our work and my vision is very similar to all of the other speakers that we've had tonight. It's, it's sort of a little bit of each in, in the work that we do. And we've also, over the years, some of the people who've come and volunteered with us, for example, more recently, Ben, um, ben suffered with bad anxiety and depression. He's now at the end of his first year in a community studies degree. So we really encourage and support people and try and help them to move on. We had um, we had a guy who worked with us called Land Rover Dave. He had appalling health issues. Um, he worked with us for six years and he was nearly in tears for thanking us for supporting him and inviting him onto the project. And all this has been done with little funding pots of a few grand here and there we've never had a massive funding pot and maybe in the future we'll end up as a, a community interest co company maybe not but i'm certainly as while i'm alive and i've still got my health i'm going to carry on doing the work that we do being reflective about what we do looking at the needs of the community and just carrying on with it so uh, a big thank you to everybody a big thank you to you thank you so much steve um, and thank you to all of our contributors. Um, we've now had five people talk about the diversity of ways that groups can be engaging in just transition work. And I think you'll all agree that we could have probably listened to all of them talk individually for two hours. Um, we will have more opportunities to hear from all of them, hopefully in the future. Mm -hmm.